Uh, the next speaker will be Professor uh, Frank Michaelman uh, of the Harvard Law School. Okay. Uh, I'm looking at Chapter 18 of Justice for Hedgehogs, where Dworkin takes his stand against Isaiah Berlin's conception of normatively, uh, normatively valued liberty as total freedom. In the view of Berlin, as described by Dworkin, the normative principle of negative liberty, of negative restraint on state regulation, covers a person's power to act in whatever way he might wish so that the principle is engaged by each and every instance of regulatory law. Dworkin, by contrast, says we need a conception by which the liberty principle covers less than that, uh, covers an area of choice that only certain laws adopted for certain reasons threaten. Uh, and my paper uh, is aimed at nailing down precisely what's at stake in this, uh, uh, in this clash over the freedom uh, idea between Dworkin uh, and Berlin. The answer is not as obvious as you might think. And by way of making that point, uh, uh, I'm going to recall a question of constitutional interpretation that's come up in several countries. The question comes up when a clause in uh, uh, a constitutional bill of rights appears to name liberty or freedom without further specification as a constitutionally protected interest or claim. Uh, uh, now, protected there never means unconditionally inviolate. It always means the interest uh, 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 is protected uh, by uh, a requirement of adequate justification for any and all infringements of it. Uh, and so the question is, should the term liberty or freedom in that constitutional clause be construed to cover the whole space of total freedom, or rather something less than that, the something less might be a set of more specifically defined liberty rights that someone, a court, decides are especially fundamental or important in some sense. So you might think that on Berlin's conception of the normative liberty principle, the answer should be that the clause does cover total freedom, whereas on Dworkin's conception, the answer should be that it doesn't, and that this shows what's at issue between the two conceptions. Uh, and one aim of my paper uh, is to show that that account of the difference, uh, 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 if you were tempted to offer it, would be wrong. It would be wrong because Dworkin doesn't really mean that the normative liberty principle covers only certain contained uh, fundamental components or dimensions of freedom but not others. Um, like, for example, the principle would cover one's choice of a sexual partner but maybe it wouldn't cover, this example comes from a German case, maybe it wouldn't cover the choice to engage in the recreational sport of falconry. Dworkin doesn't mean that we're supposed to carve up the space that way, between choices that are and are not deemed substantively deep or crucial or life-shaping. He rather says, to the contrary, and I quote that, Government infringes your liberty, normative liberty, whenever it restricts your total freedom, ha, ah, without a proper justification. And then we find that proper justification for Dworkin does not refer to some balance of state goals against the gravity of the liberty lost. It refers rather to the compatibility in principle of the state's action with certain high-level normative political ideals, Every abridgment must be congenial to the ideal of equal concern, and no abridgment may follow from a collective decision about what makes, life, uh, what makes a life good or well lived, because that would violate the ideal of respect for responsibility. Those justificatory tests apply, they have to apply to all restrictions on total freedom. If you take, for example, the law curbing indulgence in the sport of falconry, you don't start by posing a threshold inquiry as to whether that restriction on one's life is so paltry or innocuous that the demands, uh, that, uh, uh, the demands posed by Dworkin's justificatory tests don't come into play at all. You can't do that. Because in Dworkin's view, the only way you would have of answering the innocuous question would be to apply those tests of compatibility with equal concern and respect for responsibility. So there's no restriction on freedom 
that doesn't require justification in terms of those tests, not even, say, a law against spitting on the public sidewalk. That law passes Dworkin's test very easily and very obviously, but the tests do apply to it, and they apply in full force. So if we now return to our question of constitutional interpretation, it will seem that Dworkin has to side with those who would read the Constitution's residual freedom or liberty clause to cover total freedom, just as I'm sure you are thinking a follower of Berlin would do. Okay. Uh, our reflection to this point has produced a result that some uh, might find interesting, namely that total freedom figures for Dworkin as it does for Berlin as a notion that is itself normatively charged, not as one that is normatively inert or by the by. Dworkin doesn't say that every government action that someone doesn't like must meet the test of a proper justification. He says that every restriction on total freedom uh, uh, must meet the test. So what we're trying to do here is pin down uh, uh, exactly what's the difference between Dworkin and Berlin on the relevance of the total freedom notion to judgments of political right and wrong. And we see that the difference is not that infringements on total freedom are just as such a matter of concern to Berlin but not to Dworkin. They both say that justification is required for every infringement on total freedom. Now here's a little parenthesis. You might at this point object that that's wrong because it's actually only Dworkin and not Berlin who requires justification for infringements. Berlin's position, you might say, can't thus be described because for Berlin, the consummate moral pluralist, when freedom comes into collision with some other political value, such as equality or democracy or public safety or prosperity, we immediately face a tragic choice for which no right answer exists, and hence nothing in the nature of justification could be demanded. And all I want to say right now about that is that it would be controversial to read Berlin that way. In some passages, at least, Berlin appears quite clearly to believe that some infringements on total freedom can, by some form of practical judgment, be defended as morally right and necessary, whereas others cannot. But still, can't we see a clear difference between Dworkin and Berlin? Berlin does certainly believe that every regulatory restriction of total freedom, regardless of whether we judge that restriction right or wrong, gives an occasion for regret, for grieving that something of value has been sacrificed, namely the modicum of each person's total freedom that has been removed. Dworkin stoutly opposes that stance, uh, but I'm not clear about uh, exactly what the difference really finally comes to. As one way of conveying and supporting his view, Dworkin asks us rhetorically whether it really does insult our dignity whenever, proper, whenever a properly justified coercive law is adopted in a, a legitimate uh, political system. It seems to me that one could answer this way. Right, there are lots of coercive laws that don't insult our dignity. That doesn't change the fact that every single coercive law does restrict our freedom and isn't it, this is a question, uh, isn't it that fact about coercive laws, the fact that every one of them does restrict our freedom, that prompts Dworkin to insist on a proper justific justificatory showing for every coercive law? Lest it do deny our dignity as a condition of it's not denying our dignity. As I say, I pose that as a question. If it's a cogent question, then the gap between Dworkin and Berlin on the freedom question may not be all um, that it's cracked up to be. Uh, uh, I'm going to wind this up uh, uh, at this point. Uh, uh, I just, uh, I've only made uh, really one small point uh, in these remarks, that if you want to know what's really finally practically at issue between Dworkin and Berlin regarding the freedom question, you can't simply stop with the thought that the two of them differ over whether restrictions on total freedom are or are, are not, just as such, truly a matter of normative political concern. Both Dworkin and Berlin say that they are. 